How many of you have been enjoying our evidence series? It's been so good. We have been talking about the presence, the evidence of the presence of God and the fruit of the Spirit. We have had some incredible speakers this month. We started with Pastor Tim Ross. Amazing, amazing. He talked about how the fruit of the Spirit will change the way that we walk, the way that we talk, and the way that we act. I love it. You guys are with us. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that walk today. And then we had Pastor Brandon who joined us. Amazing. Our community pastor here. And he talked about how the fruit of the Spirit will cause us to be more faithful. The faithfulness of God never ends, but our faithfulness, it can increase a little bit, huh? Yeah, we can definitely always grow in that area. And then my sweetheart spoke last week, and he asked y'all, who remembers, that's good, who remembers what he asked? He asked if y'all are, if you're full of it. You remember that? I remember as he was asking us to elbow our neighbor, I always sit there and think, oh, ask him nice things. Ask him to say nice things to their neighbor. But then when he said, are you full of the joy of the Lord? I said, okay, all right, that's the kind of full of it we can be, amen? So today I am gonna take pieces of all that we have been in, because y'all, this is the last week of our evidence series. This is the week that I'm gonna pull them all together, tie a pretty bow around them, and pray that the Lord seals it in your heart, amen? I'm gonna pray for you real quick. Lord, I thank you that every single person sitting in these seats every single person watching online that you are sealing in their hearts every single piece of encouragement and hope and joy that they need for the rest of this week, the rest of this month. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Can you all believe that this is the fourth and final week of February? I'm checking myself there. It's the last one. It's the fourth. Yeah. It's the last week of February. That means we are heading into March already. Didn't we just jump into 2023. Anybody else there with me? It's been three months already. But this month, we have been talking about the significance of the fruit of the Spirit. We have been in our foundational scripture, which is Galatians 5, 22. For the most part, some of you almost have it memorized by now. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Is love, joy. Say it with me. Peace, patience. Go ahead gentleness, self-control. That's right. And these are the evidence. They are the evidence of God's presence in our lives because this is the very nature of the heart of God. Some people don't know how to relate to God because you don't really know what his nature is sometimes. This is God's nature. It is joyful. It is loving. It is kind. It is good towards us. There are expectations that he has of us, but this is God's heart. And these These fruit, it's his gift to us. He gives us the joy of the Lord. He gives us the love of the Father. He gives us that gift because the fruit of the Spirit, y'all, is the outward expression of what God is doing on the inside of us. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, and these fruit of the Spirit become part of who we are. But we have to receive them in order for them to come out of us. Amen? Anybody ever met a Christian that maybe wasn't the kindest person you've ever known? You can say yes in in church. You can say yes a little louder. I've met lots of them. We have all met Christians that we would not say necessarily demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit very well because love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, those things are not natural to us as people. Anybody in here have a little bit more of a natural response that rises up sometimes that's not love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? Yeah, because it is not a natural response because it is a response of the Spirit of God. But there's a scripture that I think is so important for us to hear, and it's Matthew 7, verse 20. It says, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so I can walk up to a tree that has apples on it, and I can say, oh, that's an apple tree, right? I can walk to a lemon tree because I know it because it has lemons on it. Second part of the scripture, it says, so you can identify people by their actions. That's that's one that we all should go, ooh, we can be identified by the way that we act. That doesn't make our life a performance. That means that people can see what's on the inside of us by what comes out of us. 
And we have to be very mindful about what's coming out of me. Is the thing that's coming out of me the thing that's natural within me that's a little ucky? Or is the thing that's coming out of me the spirit of God that I want to live in? I want to live in the gift of God. I want to live in the goodness of God. Amen? That is the thing that has to come out of us. We can literally say, tell me you're a Christian without telling me you're a Christian, without using any kind of words, because we can say all that we want. I can tell you I am a proficient guitar player, but that's not true until I prove it, right? That is not true until I sit here in front of you and show you how great I can play the guitar. I can tell you I am the best singer in the world, but if I sit next to you in worship and I am painful, then that is going to be proof of something very different, right? We can say all that we want, but people will determine your connection to Jesus by how you act, by how you act. Yet there is one thing that I find so very interesting about the fruit of the Spirit. I have yet to meet somebody that doesn't want to live a life of joy and of love and of kindness and of goodness and of patience and of peace. I've yet to meet someone that wouldn't say, I want that kind of life. People don't walk around saying, I want to be anxious and I want to be depressed and I want to be discouraged. No, No, because people want the fruit of the Spirit. They just may not be able to identify it as the fruit of the Spirit of God. I have yet to meet somebody that says they don't want it. And what I have found in that is that good fruit coming out of us as believers is not a matter of of desire. It's a matter of our choices. Can I get an amen? It is a matter of our choices. So the question that I want you all to write down in your notes before you write anything else. Maybe if you've written things, that's great. But the thing that I want you to write down and I want you to think about, one thing about me, I'm always gonna ask you a question because I am gonna tell you lots of stuff, but I want you to come back to a question because I want the revelation to be yours. I want the revelation to be deep within you about what God reveals to you about you. The question I want you to write down is how does my life produce better fruit? How does my life produce better fruit? Because some of y'all are gonna look at the fruit of the Spirit and you're gonna say, live a life of love. That's amazing. But what do I do when I don't like a lot of people? Hmm? Yeah, you can ask yourself that question. What about when I'm supposed to walk in peace? How do I carry around peace when I am so anxious with all these little people that I am supposed to be keeping alive and feeding and taking care of and making sure they don't harm themselves or other people. How am I supposed to walk in peace? What about that patience aspect? When we drive in a city where it seems as if all of the cars around us are rushing to the emergency room, right? How are we supposed to carry the kind of patience that the fruit of the Spirit is talking about? Last week, Daniel talked about about the self-control that the Holy Spirit said, okay, now he just, he got into a car accident for those of you that missed it. And as he was sitting in his car, he felt the Holy Spirit say, time for some self-control, calm it on down. And I, I, it's true, he did. He was very calm. I was very proud of him. But I sat in that sermon last week and I thought, I need self-control for every single day of being a mother. I need self-control every day to not snap in the way that the Holy Spirit was telling you not to in that moment. Can I get a another amen from a parent in the house. There is a whole lot of self-control. And as much as my children will tell everyone that there is to tell, we have four kiddos. They're all wonderful. 14 is the oldest. Three is the youngest. They don't believe that mommy has a flaw. They're so cute. They're so sweet. I adore them so much. But we have a rule in our home. And that rule is that mommy will be kind when it comes to all things except food. Do not touch mama's food. Now, I'm going to eat off of your plate. I am. That's wonderful. But when it comes to mom's food, I don't share because I want it for myself. So if I'm divvying up a portion that half of it's going to be mine, it's more like two-thirds are going to be mine and a third is going to be somebody else's. I don't find myself to be a selfish person in any area as much as food. But the truth is we all need a little help sometimes, amen? We all need some help because truly all of our lives will produce fruit. Every single one of them are gonna produce some fruit and some of that fruit is gonna be good, some of it's gonna be bad. 
So how many of you have heard of this wonderful little word called an inheritance? Anybody know about an inheritance? Anybody at all? This is what I envision up here on the screens is what some of you just did when, when you connected to the final. You're like, oh, yep, I got that. I'm in, I'm in. This one's not mine, but he's just so cute. He's just so cute. He's like, inheritance, yep, I know what that is. So an inheritance, for the most part, we all know what an inheritance is. An inheritance is when you receive some sort of gift from your parents after they pass on in life, something that you didn't earn, you just got because you were a son or you were a daughter. The thing about an inheritance is that you are entitled to it because somebody marked it for you. So y'all, what I want you to know today is that the fruit of the Spirit is part of our inheritance in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is what we inherit, not because we earned it, but because God marked us for that inheritance. It belongs to us. Now, in the natural, in life, there are probably some things that you could do to tick off your parents and you may not receive your inheritance. But in the spiritual, God says, I'm not going to hold things over your head. This is your inheritance. You just have to hold on to it. You just have to take hold of it. I want to tell you about two brothers today in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, we hear about the brothers, the twin brothers. Any twins in the house? Yeah, I'm not one. Hey, I'm not one, but I think twins are amazing. Anyways, two twin brothers. Their names are Esau and Jacob. Anybody know these brothers? Esau and Jacob are the grandchildren, the grandsons of the Abraham. Their father was the chosen son, Isaac. And they were twins. They were born just moments apart. Esau came out first, and Jacob came out holding onto his foot. And the rest of their life, he was literally vying for the privileges of being the firstborn. He was literally wishing he could have the favor and the blessing that came along with being the firstborn. Why was that? Because there was a birthright. There was a really great inheritance that came to the firstborn back in that day. It's not not the way that we do things now. The firstborns, they get things like they get to ride in the front seat, first pick, stuff like that. But back in biblical times, they had three very specific things as the birthright. The first thing is they would become the authority. They would have the authority of the father. Secondly, they got a double portion of the father's inheritance. So whatever it was, whether it was cattle, whether it was land, they didn't just get a single inheritance. They got a double portion. And they also became the priest of the family. So back then, Jesus was not the go-between. So they literally had to have a priest. We can pray to Jesus and go directly to the father now because of the new covenant. They did not have that. They needed a priest. So The firstborn would become the priest in the family. I say all that to say, big blessing, big responsibility, big honor, right? Huge. I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 through 34. And I'm gonna read you a wild story. Some of you are going to have heard of it before, but I hope that you see it from a different angle today. It says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. Now, the meaning of this word famished in this particular passage, he was just so weary and faint. He was crazy, crazy exhausted. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And Jacob replies, first, sell me your birthright. Now, I think we can pause and all recognize that Jacob was a little bit of an opportunist, right? He said, I've got something that you want. You've got something I want. We're going to make an exchange. It was a little bit of an uneven exchange. Agreed? (laughs) However, he was like, I'm going for it. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to see if there is a possibility you're going to bite. And he did. Esau says to him, look, I am about to die. He was a little dramatic. He was literally saying, I feel so exhausted and famished and tired that I feel as if I cannot go on. And Jacob, well, and then he says, what good is this birthright to me? What good would a birthright be to me? Now, y'all heard everything I said the birthright was, right? This man is saying that would be no good to me because he's convinced he would potentially die. But Jacob says, okay, so swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and then he got up and he left. So he literally said, agreed, I'm going to give up my birthright. I want that stew. 
And in that moment, he gave up his birthright, y'all. He gave up the honor of being the firstborn. He gave up the honor, which in that time, that was so privileged. That was so desired. It was so wanted because he was hungry. Now, yikes. Y'all say yikes. Yikes. We can all look at him and say, oh, Esau, Oh, Esau, it would be so easy for us to look at him and shame that man for the choice that he made in that moment, right? We can see clearly how foolish that was. We can look and say, my goodness, you lacked entire self-control. You were so immature in that moment. You had no, no ability to not be impulsive in that spot. But then I want all of us to take a look at our own lives at times. And think about all the times that you could have looked back at your life and saw yourself and said, oh, Jackie, oh, what were you thinking? It was so obvious. The decision was so clear that was not the best move to make. How in that moment did you trade it so easily? Because the truth is, sometimes we miss what is right in front of us, y'all, because we're distracted by something simple like hunger. Sometimes we miss what is right in front of us. Just the other day, my husband was telling me, just the other day, a couple from our staff was over at our house, Josh and Haley, and they had brought something to the house. And as they were leaving, Josh was saying bye to Daphne, my, my six-year-old. And he said, bye, Daphne. And she said, bye, Haley. Looked around him and said, bye to Haley. And he said, okay, I'll try again. And he said, bye, Daphne. And she said, bye, Haley. And he said, all right, well, I'm going to try another kid then. Okay, bye, Fox. And Fox said, bye, Haley. They were missing what was right in front of them because they were so distracted by Haley. They couldn't even compute the difference. They weren't being snarky. They were just missing what was plain as day in front of them. Anybody been there? Y'all, we can look and say, Esau made a bad trade. He made a bad trade. He gave up what was more valuable than anything he had ever had for the cheap in his life. He let his hunger for something fleshly override his desire for God's blessing on his life. The fruit of the Spirit, y'all, is our inherited blessing from God. But this is what I want you to ask yourself again. Are we trading it for something that won't matter tomorrow? Are we trading the blessing of God today for something that will not matter to your tomorrow? And that is where I want us to really, really look at how can we produce more fruit in our lives. I'm gonna help you out here, okay? All right, number one, I want you to write this down. We have to walk in step with the Spirit of God. We have to walk in step with the Spirit of God. Pastor Tim talked about how the fruit of the Spirit, it changes the way that we walk. So our foundational scripture is Galatians 5.22, but I wanna look at a different part of that scripture than we've referenced this, this series yet. So, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. But let's look at verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now some translations say let us also walk with the Spirit. So what this means is since we have life, because of God, since we have life in our lungs because we have been created by the creator, we choose to walk with him. Since we have life and freedom in our life because of Jesus Christ, we choose to walk with God. Any of you ever had a really great friend in life? Anybody ever had somebody that you just really like because they're really good to you, they're really kind to you, they show up when you need them, you feel safe with them. Anybody ever had that friend? What do you do with those people? You stick close. You don't run the opposite direction and go, you're great, I'll see you later. No, no, you stick close. The truth is, if I am in a crowd of people and I've got my kiddos with me, do you think that they're gonna be five feet in front of me or five feet behind me? You think they're gonna be five feet to the right or five feet to the left? Some of y'all are like, I don't know you, I don't know what you, I don't know how you do. No, the answer 
is no, they will be right at my side because this is their safe place. They can walk with dad too, but typically I would, I would pull them closer to me just, just the way I am. But I would keep them by me. Do you know what I would do when the crowd disappeared? When the crowd went away and there was no longer chaos? Do you think I would let them run five feet ahead and run five feet behind? You guys are gonna, this is a trick question, so don't answer. I still wouldn't. Not because they wouldn't be allowed the freedom, but even when there's no chaos at my side, I will still be teaching them and training them everything about life to come and the goodness of God. Because y'all, when we find a good thing, we stick close to it. Amen? When you understand the love of God, you want to walk with him. Now, this Greek word for the word walk, it is the word stoikio. And that word actually means to walk in line, to walk in a row, to keep in step. Now, some of you might remember, I have demonstrated before with Daniel about how to walk in the shadow of the Lord and to really be hidden behind him. But I wanna demonstrate a different type of walking. I'm gonna have two gentlemen come out here. Now, can you all welcome Sean and Isaac to the stage as they come on out? I'm gonna demonstrate a different type of walking. If you all just kind of keep your eyes on them, they are just walking in relationship, okay? What you're gonna see is they're just walking together. And sometimes in relationship, when you're just walking together, sometimes you get distracted and you go other directions. Maybe you take a phone call, a person distracts you. Maybe if you're the sort of person that you see like a bird in the sky and you stop and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. And then they meander back towards one another and they catch up and they say, hey, how's it going? Haven't seen you in a while. This is what we often do in relationship with the Lord. We just kind of do our own thing, go our own direction. We mosey on back to God and we catch up and we feel good about our relationship because we're close again. Remember, we've caught up. But there's a different kind of walking in relationship that this word is talking about when it says to keep in step. That indicates, that indicates a rhythm, y'all. That indicates a different kind of synchrony in the way that we walk, y'all. Because when you lock step with the Spirit of God, there is an ease that comes and you no longer have to carry the weight of wondering where you're going. You get to see the path in front of you. And there are two things that happen when we lock step with the Spirit of God. One thing is we walk away from what was behind us, y'all. We walk away from what was behind and we focus forward on the things of God. See, there is an importance in understanding that there is a pace. Y'all can thank our team right now. Can you give them, can you give them a big thank you? Byron on the drums. There is a pace, y'all. There is a pace, but we don't set it. The Holy Spirit sets that pace. And when we fall in sync with the Spirit of God, there is a different type of confidence, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness that we carry because we understand, I don't have to have all of these answers, but I do have to leave behind what was behind and move forward. Where he goes, I go. What he says, I say. I am living in the will of God because of the word of God. And in order to keep in step with the spirit of God, we have to reject the habits of the flesh. Y'all, I'm gonna start zinging you now, is that all right? You okay if I start ah, poking at you? You know I like to poke. So you have to reject the habits of the flesh because those distract us and they pull us back to our old ways and our old patterns of thinking. There is a comparison word here in verse 22. Y'all, if we could throw, throw up Galatians 5.22 again on the screen behind me. There's a comparison word that we often skip over here. What's that first word at the beginning of the scripture? But. but. Say it a little louder. But. but in the English 
language, I often tell you about the Greek, but in the English language, but is actually a connecting word. It compares two things. It compares what came before and it compares what came after. So we know what verse 22 says. We know that verse 22 is about the fruit of the Spirit. But what is this comparing to? Because in verse 19, verse 19 talks about the works of the flesh. So this but word says that in order to get to the fruit of the Spirit, we have to leave behind the works of the flesh. There is a comparison. It is one or the other. Say one or the other. I gotta choose. You have to choose one or the other. Are you okay if I read to you this verse 19? You guys good with that? You okay if I just go there, if I just make it plain, if I just lay it out for you? Because I think sometimes when people talk about the works of the flesh, they think, oh, murder. Yeah, I can't murder anybody. God doesn't like that. That's the only thing I'm not allowed to do. But the word is a lot more specific than that, y'all. We have to take the time to read it. Now, I'm gonna give you two different translations. The first one is the English Standard Version. The way it starts, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Evident, we're talking about evidence, right? This is saying there's evidence to works of the flesh. Verse 22 says there's evidence to fruit of the Spirit. There's evidence. And then this one goes on, English Standard goes on to say the things you think. Yes, when we think of works of the flesh, we think of sexual immorality, we think of impurity, absolutely. But the Message Bible, I love the way that it says this entire translation. It says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Yikes! That is the works of the flesh, is trying to get our own way all the time. And then it goes on to say, yes, sexual immorality. And then it says, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Just poof. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All consuming yet never satisfied once. A brutal temper. Am I making anybody uncomfortable yet? Okay, that's good. An impotence to love or be loved. Divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on, says the word. There is works of the flesh and there are fruit of the Spirit. And we have a choice right there in the middle which direction we're gonna hang out in. Because whichever seed we choose will produce a fruit. And it will be a good fruit or it will be a bad fruit. And we will have to live with that choice just like Esau had to live with his choice. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, run away from childish indulgence. Run after mature righteousness, faith, love, peace. Joining those who are in honest and serious prayer before God. Romans 8, 5 says, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Y'all, if we are not synced up with the goodness of God in our spirits and in our minds, in our minds, that's where the choice happens then others will not see the goodness of God through us. Ouch, that feels judgmental and critical, doesn't it? But if you don't feel and understand and know and are confident in because you are connected to the goodness of God, then it will not overflow out of your life. What will overflow out of your life is what you have your mind set on. I can wish myself to be five foot 10 and an avid runner all day long, y'all, all day long. But if it is not my practice, it's not gonna be my fruit. If it's not my practice, it will not be my fruit. We have to walk in step with the Spirit of God. And number two, I'm gonna make this one simple so you can still continue to chew on that last one, okay? Number two, we have to be willing to be pruned. Be willing to be pruned. John 15 verses one and two says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. 
I think the part about God cutting off the stuff that's bad in our lives, we can process a little bit, but I think sometimes the part about where we are actually bearing fruit and doing well in an area when God says, I want you to do better. I think sometimes we go, oh, but I was doing good. I was making good choices. But God says, I want to prune that which is bearing good fruit so that it can bear even more fruit. So we have to let him remove the unnecessary things. Those are the bad fruit. We gotta let him remove those, y'all. That may be the bad things that he removes. He may remove the bad behaviors, the bad attitudes. He may remove the people from your life that shouldn't be there, in which case y'all should say thank you, Jesus. And when you get to that moment where God took some of those people out of your life and you sit there and wonder, why did they leave? Stop and thank the Lord above that he removed the bad fruit from your life because you are not needing to live in that space. But we also have to let him prune the fruitful parts so that there can be more good fruit. The Greek word for to prune is actually the same meaning as the word to cleanse. So what he wants to do when he says he wants to prune, he just wants to polish it up. He wants to take the good fruit in your life. Have you ever seen anybody, um, uh, I don't even know the right word for it, but when they, it's not really a blow, like a, to blow on it, but when they on an apple and then they polish it. You ever seen anybody do that? That's what he wants to do with the fruit in your life. He says, this is good fruit. I just wanna shine this up. I want it to be even more fruitful. That is what he wants to do when he says, I wanna cleanse you. And so often, y'all, he uses the word and he uses people to do that pruning in our lives. So my ask of you this morning is that when you encounter people in your life that want to just call a spade a spade and say, hey, that is not a work of the spirit. That's a work of the flesh. Don't close the door on them. Don't shut them out of your life. Allow people to prune you when they see a work of the flesh and a fruit of the spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, number three. Y'all, we gotta stay hungry. We have to stay hungry. We have to stop looking to be satisfied and look to be filled. Satisfaction is temporary. Being filled never ends. Anybody's kid ever left a water faucet running? Anybody ever had a plugged sink in their home? The water just stays there. There is a difference in being satisfied and being filled. The fullness never ends when you are filled. I don't know about you all, but I don't encourage my kids, just eat until you're satisfied. Just eat until you've had just enough. I tell them to eat until you're full. That's the heart of God. His heart is for us to overflow with the fruit of the Spirit because it's his goodness. It's his kindness. He wants it to be so abundant in our lives that there is never an end. Y'all, things satisfy for just a moment, but the Holy Spirit is fulfilling. We all hunger for something. You can call that passion, you can call that desire, you can call it whatever you want. We all hunger for something, but we can choose to desire things that will satisfy us in this moment only. We can be soup people. Anybody in here wanna eat just soup the rest of your life? Lentil soup, just like Esau. Oh, come on, put your hand down back there. <laughs> so there really was someone back there with their hand up. We don't wanna eat just soup for the rest of our lives only because soup is not as filling as the real meat of what God, you don't have to eat meat, but the real meat of what God has for us in life. We can hunger for what develops our character. We can yield good fruit in our lives, in our relationships, in our families, in our careers. Y'all, right now, there are some revival moments happening across our nation. Y'all, if you're looking, there's some revival moments happening here at Hope City. If you are looking, we have to recognize that there are light bulb moments that are happening all across the body of Christ where we realize we live because of him. We live because of him. So we should not just visit with him. We should find our life in him. That's continual. That's that rhythm. Y'all should hear yourself all, through, all throughout the day saying, how am I walking? Am I wandering or am I locked in? Am I in step with the Spirit of God? All the joy, all the love, all the peace, all the kindness, all the goodness, all those things come 
from him, from time in his presence. And every day we get to reject the old and we get to embrace the new that we find in relationship with him. Yo, I wanna be a church and a people that are hungry for the things of God. Amen? Stay hungry. And if you feel like at the end of the day you're just satisfied, what is satisfying you? Because you should be full of the presence of God. Would y'all stand to your feet? I've invited the worship team. We're gonna go back in to just one more song before we wrap up the service here. And I want y'all just to press in. Think about those questions that I asked. Ask yourself, talk to the Lord and enter into worship just for a moment here. I want to ask you one specific question. I want to ask you if you need to see the fruit of the Spirit being expressed in your life more. If you are in this place, if you're watching online, and you would say, I need more of the fruit of the Spirit. I need more love. I need more joy. I need more kindness. I need more goodness. I need the heart of God in my life more then I want you to lift your hand right now just to simply say before God, I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering my fleshly works. For those of you in this place that would say, I need to step away from the works of the flesh and I need to step more towards the fruit of the Spirit, I want y'all to lift your hands right now towards the Lord. For those of you that say, I gotta move away from some stuff, I gotta put some stuff behind, I have to let go of some things that have been holding me back and I'm surrendering right now, surrendering right now. I already know you, Jesus, but I just need to let these things go. Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person that has had their hands lifted, every single person online that is positioned in a posture that says, God, I need you in my life more than I have been allowing. I need to hold you closer. I need to walk closer in step with you, God, so that the goodness that you have in my life would flow out of me more. I pray today that there is a peace upon them just for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And y'all can put your hands down and keep your, your head bowed and your eye closed because I have a very specific prayer for another group of people. 
And that is for those of you in this place that would say, I do not know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I do not live in the freedom that you speak of. I do not know the joy of the Lord. I have not yet surrendered my life to a Father that loves me. I have lived as exactly what the Word said. I have lived to do everything my own way. And today, I want to walk away from that life and I wanna give my life to Jesus Christ. If you are in this place and you would say, I would like to repent, I'd like to turn away from this old life and I would like to ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life or if you would like to rededicate your life today and you would say, I got lost, I wandered too far and I wanna come back to the presence of God today. If either one of those are you, if you want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life today, or if you wanna rededicate your life, would you just lift your hand up really quickly? Just lift your hand up before God. Come on, church, I see you back there. I see you over there. Church, can we celebrate? I see y'all, church. I see you. And more importantly, God sees you. So can we all pray this prayer together? Can we all bow our heads and say, Dear Lord, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent. I move away from the ways in which I used to live for myself. I receive you, Jesus, as the Lord of my life. I ask you to be my Lord. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate, church.